Hello. How you doing? Are you having a good week, everybody? You know what? When I first started this podcast, about two or three years ago, I had no real idea what I was doing at all. And I probably still don't, but I have a better idea of what I'm doing now. But anyway, my point is, is that I, I had an expectation of what this podcast might become, what it might be like. And, you know, right out of the gate, um, I was a little bit disappointed because I realized that, you know, I had this vision in my mind of, you know, people responding and engaging with me all the time, like right out of the gate, you know, and that wasn't the case. You know, it took me a long time to get people to really respond and, you know, uh, interact with me. Okay. Um, and it's taken a long time to, you know, gain this small audience. It's still small, but, you know, to gain that audience, that small audience, it took a long time. And I had hoped in the beginning that, you know, I would get people asking questions and, you know, sharing opinions and all those things. And it didn't happen right away. But now I can tell you, I'm happy to say that I think I have finally arrived there. Okay, where I had hoped to be when I first started about two or three years ago, I finally arrived there now. <laughs> And last week, I released a podcast, and I got a comment, actually, a question from one of the listeners. And, you know, it was a question about my opinion about a specific album from the band Tool, okay? Um, And this person was asking me what I thought of the new Tool album. Uh, in case you didn't know, Tool has released a new album probably about a month or two ago, maybe longer now. Um, the title of the album is Fear Inoculum. And, uh, you know, I was just so happy to get this question, you know, because it gives me the opportunity to talk about a couple of things that I really like to talk about. And, you know, Basically, (laughs) what I like to talk about more than probably anything else is drummers. You know, I love talking about drums and drummers and, you know, I mean, I've been doing this for so long. You know, I've been a drummer for, man, you know, over 40 years. I mean, actively drumming for over 40 years. And uh, I've never stopped, you know, I I still listen to new drummers and it's almost like, to me, it's almost like a sport. And like I was saying in the last episode, you know, there is like a, an athletic element to being a drummer. You know, this is a very physical instrument. There's a lot of physicality and um, you're using your body, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And people don't really understand that aspect of it, that there's a certain amount of endurance you need to have and all those kinds of things. And I just love that stuff, you know, the mechanics and the details and getting into the minutia of being a drummer. I love talking about that stuff, you know, and I don't really usually get an opportunity to do so. So like I said, I got this question, Mike, you know, what do you think of the new Tool album? And okay, so I'm going to answer that question today in this episode, all right? I'm going to take some time to sit down and talk to you about the new Tool album, my opinion. Well, I would say that um, I did listen to the entire album, not all the way through, okay? I did kind of skim. It was maybe a month and a half ago, maybe a little bit longer now, right when it came out. And, uh, of course, like everyone else, I was very curious to hear what Tool had come up with on their sixth album, uh, Fear Inoculum. And I suppose I should premise this whole episode of the Singularity Podcast talking about Tool's new album by kind of uh, talking a little bit about when I first heard about Tool. You know, I've been listening to them for quite some time. 
Um, I wouldn't say that I'm a huge fan. You know, I appreciate what they do. Uh, I think they're phenomenal musicians. There's no question about it. Um, but uh, what's weird is when I was much younger, I had dated a girl who was a couple years younger than me. And uh, I went to her prom with her. And they had this table set up at her prom. Okay, now you, the idea, I guess, what the evening was to, uh, you know, like they had games and, you know, stuff like that. And you would win like tickets. And then you could take these tickets and go to this table and you could buy gifts off this table with these tickets, right? Well, it was really kind of weird because there was not much on this table that I was interested in, okay? Um, but there was sitting on this table, this little cassette tape, and it was from Zoo Records. It was a group called Tool, and the album was called Opiate. So, you know, I threw my tickets down, I grabbed this cassette tape, and then later that weekend, you know, we went uh, camping or something, like a bunch of couples, you know, went camping somewhere. And, you know, I popped this Tool Opiate cassette tape into my boom box. And, oh my goodness, it was like right from the onset. It was like everybody that was there was just like, oh my gosh, like, who is this? I'm like, this is this band Tool. You know, they're from California and they just came out with this album, this cassette, you know? And, uh, you know, I'm sure by now all the songs on that EP, I think it was an EP, yeah, all, all the uh, songs are really famous and everything. But uh, the reason I'm explaining that is because, you know, it kind of illustrates how far back I go with Tool. And, you know, right around that same time, I was playing a gig with a band. I've talked about this in a past podcast. Um, you know, a band had asked me to sit in because their drummer couldn't do the show. And I agreed. And uh, they were opening for Tool. And that was the gig that I sat in on. And I got a front row seat. And it was like one of those shows where there was like nobody there. You know, you could see Tumbleweed blowing through this place, you know, through the club. And, uh, you know, even when Tool came out, I mean, because nobody knew who they were. You know, they were unknown. But, um, oh my gosh, I was there, you know, I had a front row seat. There was nobody there, just me standing in front of the stage, you know, watching Tool just go off, you know, they were just so awesome. And, um, uh, I always remembered that, you know, like the, my impression of them, you know, with that cassette was like, oh my gosh, this is great. When I saw them live, it was like, oh my gosh, these guys are great. I really thought they were good, but I had no idea how huge they were going to become and how important they would become to rock and roll, you know, rock and roll history and, and music history. Okay. Because I do think that Tool is on that level. Okay. Um, now, like I said, I'm not a huge fan of Tool, but I can appreciate what they're doing. And I'm always excited to listen to what they come up with because they're so creative, you know. And uh, I remember being in Texas, actually, uh, in Austin, Texas for South by Southwest when uh, they released the Undertow album back in 1993. And I remember it was like everybody was just going bullshit over this album, you know. It was like everywhere in Austin for that week and everybody was talking about it and they had that video out that was really crazy and and the cover art was awesome and it just sounded so good um and i'm not a hundred percent sure but i think that album was produced by sylvia massey i'm not sure but she's like a hero of mine um and it was just it was like i remember that vividly you know like everybody ranting about this new Tool album, you know? And of course, you know, I listened to it and it's just, it's a classic now. But I kind of, at that time, like right after that time, I kind of tuned out a little bit. I wasn't like a huge fan. I could appreciate their sound and everything, but 
you know, I was into other kinds of music, you know, and um, so years later, you know, Anima comes out like in 1995 or 96, uh, and then Lateralist came out in 2000 or 2001, and I remember people kind of telling me about that one. That's when, when I kind of listened again to Tool and got into them a little bit, you know. And uh, actually, it was interesting because my wife was taking a statistics course and uh, in college, and they were studying the Fibonacci sequence, and Tool Lateralis came up because I believe, if I remember correctly, that album was based on the Fibonacci sequence. I think that's right. Um, and... Uh, it's when I got into the artwork of Alex Gray, you know, uh, because of Tool, really. I mean, come on, let's face it. And, uh, oh, that's a game changer. That guy's artwork is just crazy good, you know. And um, I wasn't on board for 10,000 days. Not that I didn't like it or anything, but uh, it came and went and I didn't even know. I was busy, you know, doing other stuff. But uh, just this past summer, you know, Fear Inoculum comes out and I guess uh, for a long period of time um, like the album was postponed like the release of the album was postponed from what I remember and they finally you know were able to get past the hurdles they had and release this album so now into what I think about this album and I gotta tell you um, I was satisfied you know with how good it was and the production and everything and you know, it's Tool. You know, they're great. They are still great. There is no question about that. They're very creative and uh, they have their own thing going on. You know, they really kind of took the mantle of progressive rock. And there's other bands that you know, would make the same claim, you know, like Dream Theater and, you know, uh, there's so many, you know. But if you ask me, you know, King Crimson used to hold that title and Tool came and just kind of snatched it right out of their hands and I think that they are you know probably as far as prog rock is concerned man they're like the Beatles of prog rock I mean nobody does it like Tool now having said that you know uh, when I was listening to this new album I gotta say there were some elements to this album that were disappointing to me now, it's so hard to explain this, but okay, I'll try. There are two basic schools of drummers in the world, okay? And those two groups can break down into, you know, millions of subsidiaries. But basically, you have two schools of thought when it comes to this instrument of rock drums, you know, playing rock and roll drums. And um, there's the guys who think that heavy and uh, you know, intense drumming is more of a logical, cerebral thing, okay? They... Uh, equate complicated time signatures with power and energy, okay? And I get that. I've known a lot of drummers that are that way, okay? But I am not that way. Now, there's another school of thought when it comes to this instrument of drums, and that school of thought is more like the ACDC kind of drumming, okay? Where heaviness and intensity comes from hitting those damn things as hard as you can, you know? And uh, the drummers who are more logical and, and more into complicated time signatures and stuff like that, they tend to be more jazz-oriented drummers. They play from the elbows down, a lot of the wrists. You know, if you watch Danny Carey drum, 
uh, you'll see that he doesn't really move his arms a lot. He's doing a lot of movement from the elbow down. Everything is from the hip. You know, he's shooting from the hip, kind of like. Um, and But then when you watch somebody like, let's say, Lars Ulrich, you know, he's using his shoulders. You know, he's 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 using his back and his shoulders and like everything from the elbow up to hit hard. And that is the problem that I had with this Tool album. I mean, I think the guitar work from Adam Jones is amazing. And of course, Maynard Keenan's voice and his lyrics and subject matter and there's the production on his voice. It's like unparalleled, man, you know? And of course, Justin Chancellor, he's featured on this album too. You know, he's not just a bass player. I mean, they all are so creative, including Danny Carey. But the problem that I have is like, I'm listening to this Tool album, song by song goes by, and I'm waiting for Danny Carey to explode. You know, he's like, he's got all this tribal stuff going on and it's like percolating. And that's what tribal stuff tends to do, right? Like in a song or in a mix, it, t- it tends to kind of build tension, you know, you know, like you're building up to something and you're, you're waiting, you're waiting for that moment when it just releases and Danny Carey just will start slamming, you know, a straight beat, man, just cracking thud drums, just like killing them. Cause this dude, Danny Carey from Tool is huge. I mean, his arms are huge. All the drummers that play heavy music really well, their arms are really strong. You know, it's part of the territory. And you just look at this guy. It's like, okay, let's see him put a stick through a drum head. You know, he's like just killing these things, but it doesn't happen. And that's the problem I had with this Tool album is like, please just like, just for at least eight bars, just play a straight beat, you know, like, but that's not what happens. You know, it's like, it was so disappointing in that sense, like, I'm just waiting for it. And it's frustrating because it's like, it's cool that he's highly sophisticated and complicated and everything. And I can appreciate that because it's hard to do what he does. It's not easy. And it's hard to copy what he does, but it's even harder to make it up. You know, let's not forget that, that, you know, prior to Danny Carey sitting down and recording this music, these drum parts you know he had to come up with it there was nothing and he had to come up with something and this is what he came up with and it's really good you know um i mean at this point i would say it's safe to say that you know when you buy a ticket for a tool concert it's kind of the danny carey show you know it's really kind of what it's about now i mean yeah all the guys in the band have their place and everything but it's it's so obvious now when you watch like concert footage of tool and even when you listen to their albums that this is really the danny carey show like if you ask me it's all about the drums and everything else is kind of secondary to you know what danny carey is laying down you know he is the star of the show and um rightfully so I mean, this guy is a machine, you know, he's incredible, but you know, there's a drummer I've talked about him before. He used to play for merciful fate and King diamond. And then he played for motorhead. And now I think he's playing for the scorpions since Lemmy Kilmeister died. Um, his name is Mickey D. And if you ask me, okay, at least from my school of thought, my position okay he's probably the greatest living rock drummer that i can think of and i know that's all subjective but um the reason that i do like him so much is because he has so much power in his playing and intensity and yeah he does some complicated stuff he does some you know high-minded you know complex polyrhythmic stuff he can do that but he's a rock drummer you know like 
sometimes you just gotta like ride the lightning, man. You just gotta like slam those things. You know, to me, that's where it's at. You know, Chuck Biscuits from Danzig, like kill the drums, man. Like play loud, play hard. And Danny Carey, to me, kind of belongs to a different school and a different way of thinking. Probably a more intelligent form of playing this instrument, probably a more sophisticated approach to it. But to me, it's just a lot less exciting, you know? So, you know, was the album a disappointment? The album by Tool, Fear Inoculum, was it a disappointment? No, not at all. I mean, it's like Shakespeare, it's great. You know, who's gonna deny that? It's another Tool album. Of course, it's, you know, friggin' amazing. You know, the stuff that they come up with and the the atmospheres and the textures and the weirdness and the odd time signatures. And it's just, you know, mind bending music, you know, almost like a dark, heavy radio head, you know, but better, you know. Um, So, you know, what would I give the album on a scale from one to ten? You know, I would probably give it a nine. You know, I don't think it's Tool's greatest album. Um, I hope that in the future, that somewhere on the next album, you know, they'll do a song where they just kill it. You know, a straight 4-4, man. And it's heavy. It's all get out, you know. It just blows your hair back. It's so heavy. Instead of this, you know, percolating in you know tension building drum thing all the time like okay like change now like do something else now and that's not as far as i'm concerned anyway that's not what tool fans want okay and that's probably why i would not consider myself a tool fan so there you go um But I'll tell you what, I appreciate that comment and that question because I love to talk about this stuff. I mean, a lot of the time I, you know, I'm scrambling to come up with something to talk about, right? I usually wind up talking about myself, which, you know, is really lame. But, uh, ooh, you know, this one, it just got me going. I started thinking about it and thinking about it and thinking about it because I could talk about this stuff all day, you know? Um... I love giving my opinion about music, especially other people's music. You know, I used to write reviews for a rock and roll magazine uh, back in the day when I was younger. You know, a friend of mine had owned this magazine and uh, she had asked me if I would be willing to go to some concerts and review some bands and listen to CDs and review those. And I did. So I do have a little bit of a history in that. But uh, I just love music so much, and I love to talk about it so much, and I love to talk about the drums so much. But you know what? Now that I'm saying that, I'm you know I'm thinking about Adam Jones. You know, um, I'm thinking about Maynard Keenan. You know, and uh, Justin Chancellor too. And it's like you know Adam Jones, as far as guitar playing is concerned, he's the guitar player from Tool. In case you don't know. Um, I'm not sure that there's been another guitar player quite like him. And you can kind of tell by his private life, like the way he lives away from the music. Um, like th- We're talking about somebody who is probably, probably genius level intellect. Um, certainly creative genius, if not anything else. Um, you know, he's the guy who puts together their videos. Can you imagine? And I mean, some of those videos are classics now, and they're amazing to watch and to think that their guitar player is the one who put that together, as well as like the killer guitar lines you're hearing him come up with. Oh, it's amazing that a human brain can be capable of that much, you know? And uh, so unsung too. I mean, he's just, you know, when you get a list of the top 50 guitar players, I'm not even sure if he makes the list, but he should, you know? But he's understated. He paints 
with sound on his guitar, you know, um, and I never get tired of listening to that because it's so difficult to be a guitar player like Adam Jones. All right. And, uh, you know, Justin Chancellor, I think, um, over the years that he's been in the band, he wasn't the original bass player in case you didn't know. Um, you know, he's really kind of, um, sunk in to his own thing now, you know, he is just as creative a writer on the bass guitar as Adam Jones is on the guitar. And I suppose it would have to be that way, right? They're complimenting each other. Uh, they have a lot of space to fill those two guys, you know, sonically, and they do it like unlike anyone else does, you know? Um, and then of course there's Maynard Keenan and man, I'll tell you what. Okay. A lot of the time I don't like Maynard Keenan's subject matter. (laughs) I don't like it because it's so negative all the time which is okay. It's heavy music. It's supposed to be dark and heavy, you know, but what he does with his voice and the ideas and the lyrics and, you know, his approach to the microphone and to lyric writing and, you know, um, production on his voice. I think personally, it just keeps getting better and better. I don't think that Maynard Keenan has ever taken a step backwards uh, with what he's doing with his voice on Tool Records. I mean, I think each album is a clinic, really, on uh, how to approach progressive music vocally. Actually, you know what? Every single Tool album that's ever been released is a clinic in how to do it. I mean, that's probably the best way to describe what I hear when I listen to a Tool album. It's a clinic on how to play progressive music, p- progressive rock. Um, that's why I was saying before that I really do feel, and I know a lot of people disagree, okay, but I really do feel that Tool kind of came and snatched that mantle right away from King Crimson because. You know, for decades, King Crimson, even still, you know, there are people who argue that King Crimson is the greatest progressive rock group on the planet, probably the greatest that will ever be. Okay. But I don't know. I don't know. I kind of think like Tool, certainly from a commercial success standpoint, they've surpassed King Crimson, I think. And, um, they're the heir apparent to the crown. If you know, I, I think they've taken it already, but if you don't agree, I think they're at least the runner up, you know? Um, and what's interesting too, is that tool, uh, from my best estimation belongs to a class of rock groups. Uh, let's see. That's very small. So it would be like tool Genesis, um, King Crimson, Pink Floyd. Um, the the audience for those groups is so loyal and so rabid, you know. It goes beyond just commercial success. It's more like a loyalties thing, you know, a way of life. Like, um, actually, you know, what's funny is a while ago, I was listening to a song by Genesis on YouTube, and I had made a comment because it was a song that Phil Collins had sung. And I'm a pretty big Peter Gabriel fan. You know, I'm a pretty big Peter Gabriel fan, but I think that a lot of the time Phil Collins kind of got dissed, you know, and it wasn't always justified. I mean, in the early days of Genesis, when Phil Collins took over the vocals, um, some of what they were laying down was really great. And his voice was great. And I would argue that sometimes I think his voice is even a little bit better than Peter Gabriel's. And oh my gosh, you know, I made a comment along those lines on this one song and the response I got was rabid. You know, the people were like, you know, 
so serious about it, you know? Like, how dare you, you know, insult Peter Gabriel? You know, how, how, how dare you, you know? And uh, I guess I can understand that. I can appreciate it anyway, if I can't understand it. Like, you know, the people are so loyal to this group. You know, they mean so much to people that, you know, you can't say anything bad about them. And I can understand that. That goes for Pink Floyd. You know, it goes for, like I said, Genesis. King Crimson is one of those bands. Maybe Dream Theater um, and certainly Tool, you know. And what's kind of funny is I have a funny little story I'll share with you. I was at a friend of mine's house once. He was having a party and it wasn't like a beer party. It was like everybody came over to this dude's house to watch uh, Secret World, the Peter Gabriel video, like right when it first came out. Okay. And uh, so I'm sitting there and I'm I'm a pretty big Peter Gabriel fan. But, you know, these guys, it was like a room full of dudes and a couple chicks all drinking beers and, you know, partying, watching this video kind of like quietly, you know, just reverently soaking it in and just like getting so into it. And, oh, you know, Biko, oh my gosh, or, you know, uh, Salisbury Hill, oh, I love the song, you know, just like worshiping Peter Gabriel, you know. And I'm sitting there kind of laughing a little bit to myself because I thought, you know, these guys are getting a little too excited about this, you know? So, uh, this is why I'm bringing up the story, by the way. Okay, so, uh, the song Sledgehammer starts, you know? And I say, like, just loud enough for everybody in the room to hear. I'm like, oh, finally, something good. And they all shot me this look, man. (laughs) I just totally, totally like instantaneously chapped their asses, you know, like, but, you know, I laughed and said, just kidding. You know, I'm just kidding, guys. Calm down. You know, I almost got ran out of the room, you know, like, how dare you say that about Sledgehammer? It's terrible, you know? It's nothing compared to Don't Give Up or Mercy Street or, you know, Red Rain, you know. (sighs) You know, (laughs) I thought that was a funny story. Been wanting to tell that one for a while. So anyway, okay, I got to wrap up. I got to get back to work. But I did do what I promised, which was a response to that comment. I told the guy, hey, I'll do my next podcast about that. Thank you for the comment. And hey. I'll I'll put it out there. I'll float it. If any of you guys out there listening to this right now, you want to know my opinion about anything, like anything, any group, or I don't know, world event or history or I don't know, future event, you know, conspiracies, anything. I don't know. Put it in the comments section. I'll answer, you know. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, my happy innovators, have a great weekend. Stay out of trouble, be safe, and, you know, have some fun. And also, remember, folks, if you want to keep what you've got, you've got to give it away. Take it easy. Okay, hombres, all you happy innovators that decided to stick around until after the podcast had ended. Well, I kind of have a little interesting kind of idea that I put together for you today with this episode. Now, what I'm going to do is, like I explained to you a, a few episodes back about how I have pipe choir music, PC1 music, PC3 music, right? These three different styles that I do. And um, I figured, okay, the best way to really kind of illustrate that to you is to give you today three different versions of the same song, okay? So 
the song I chose is a song I wrote called Children of the Sun. Okay, I wrote it a long time ago. We'll get into that later. But what you're going to hear today first is the PC-1 version of Children of the Sun, which is more acoustic-based. Um, you know, it's a little more subdued. Then you're going to hear the pipe choir version of Children of the Sun, which is a little more rocking, you know, a little more aggressive, okay? And then you're going to hear the PC-3 version of Children of the Sun. Uh, you know, three different versions of the same song. So without further ado, here is the PC-1 version of Children of the Sun. Children of the 
So there you go. That's the PC one version of Children of the Sun. And you know what? I really liked that version of the song. And I knew while I was putting it together and everything, I knew that it was going to be pretty good. I can usually tell, you know, uh, pretty early on if an idea is really going to be good. And I felt that that one was really strong. And apparently, you know, a lot of my fans did too, because it does pretty well. You know, it did pretty well for me. Um, so now what you're going to hear is the pipe choir version of Children of the Sun. Now, this version of the song is like the original idea. This is how I intended the song originally to be heard. Like, this is how I wrote it. Okay. Um, with drums and, you know, full instrumentation. So without further ado, here is the pipe choir version of Children of the Sun. Same song that you heard just a few minutes ago, but just a different version. So here we go.
so there you go. That's the pipe choir version of Children of the Sun. I hope that you liked it because, you know what, I liked it a lot too. I liked it when I wrote it, you know, and I wrote it probably back in like 2004, maybe earlier than that, no, but I would say about 2004. And um, it kind of went through, that song in particular went through uh, several different kind of variations um, in the writing process. I wound up re-recording it several times over the years, just trying to improve it a little bit or whatever. And then with the Pipe Choir Escon's project, I decided that I would, you know, finally officially release Children of the Sun as a finished song. So that's what you just heard. So what you're going to hear now is the reinterpretation of Children of the Sun uh, under the name PC3. And basically what PC3 is, really, is just taking, you know, shorter pieces of music and extending them, you know, um, arranging them differently, kind of uh, reinterpreting them, uh, stretching the song out uh, into a longer form, which I refer to as honest wave music, um, music that's 15 minutes long or more. And, you know, basically what I do that for is, well, one, there's a lot of people who apparently like long form, long playing songs, um, whether it's to meditate to or to exercise to. They do yoga to it or um, they put it in their videos on YouTube uh, as background music. And that's really kind of like my bread and butter, really, you know, so um Without further ado, here is the PC3 version of Children of the Sun. Um, a little more orchestral. I wanted to go for something like that um, with timpani and pizzicato strings and, um, you know, not necessarily bombast, but uh, very dramatic and theatrical, cinematic kind of sound. And uh, I was pretty happy with the way that it came out. So, again, without further ado, here is the PC3 version of Children of the Sun.
All right, so there you go, happy innovators. A perfect way of illustrating the difference between PC1, Pipe Choir, and PC3, right? It should be abundantly clear. I hope that you enjoyed this little excursion we had today. And, um, you know, I don't know, maybe somewhere down the line I'll do something a little bit similar to this. You know, um, how about, you never know. That's the good thing about this little uh, addition thing I'm putting on the end of my podcasts. It's wide open. You know, there's no particular format or anything, right? So maybe I'll surprise you next time with something else. But until then, ladies and gentlemen, my happy innovators, remember... That if you want to keep what you've got, you've got to give it away. Take it easy. <laughs>